All right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am joining you today as the host of this program in my first webinar as the Canadian Coordinator for the Nature for All Global Community. For those of you who have no idea what Nature for All is, I wanted to bring it up on the screen for you guys to check out. Do feel free to go to this website while I'm talking about it over the next minute or so. So Nature for All uh, was founded in 2016 at the IUCN meeting in Hawaii, and the idea was to create a campaign, a movement, a network of all the nature education and conservation organizations around the globe with this shared mission of trying to encourage their communities to fall in love with nature and wildlife. There is no uh, topic that interests me more than that. Having grown up personally with Steve Irwin and David Attenborough as my personal heroes, uh, it was really exciting to see the power of this network to turn small campaigns into big ideas and to link people that are doing you know, cutting edge work in conservation and in nature education around the globe into something concrete and meaningful. So to my understanding, there is no better nature network on this planet and it's a privilege and pleasure to get the chance to coordinate this Canadian network because if my career has been one thing, it has been the opportunity to work with so many amazing, really intelligent, dedicated, passionate people across this country. Uh, and I'm so excited to dive in with this webinar, which I think is on a topic of extreme interest as our, our kickoff opening celebration of, of everything that I get to do in this role. Now, I get to be the Nature for All Canadian Coordinator through my day job. And my day job, for those who might not know, is at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So I am the VP of Education there, which is a fancier way of saying I am one of the two-man team at the organization. And what we do is about 50 monthly live free digital interactive broadcasts. So we connect scientists and explorers, conservationists, amazing places around the world with kids through broadcasts that get them inspired and excited and, and teach them about the world in a really new way, hearing from experts live on location in amazing places globally. Now, I introduced this with regards to this program because of how our registration works. So we're very lucky to be in a position where when we put out our newsletter of programs, we have about 30 to 40 live classes registered for every single session, which translates to about 250 to 300 kids that we bring in for any broadcast, anything from particle physics to cave diving, zoology, you know, NASA astronauts and more. We're very lucky to be in that position. Last week, we partnered with the Downey Wenjack Fund. So for the several years now, we've been partnering with the Gord Downey and Cheney Wenjack Fund. They do amazing work on truth and reconciliation in Canada to host their Secret Path Week. So Secret Path Week is an incredible celebration. Every year we do about 15 to 20 programs with Indigenous artists, uh, recorders, uh, musical uh, folk of, of all kind, and people who can tell really amazing, heartfelt, personal stories of their experiences being Indigenous uh, over the last many decades, in some cases, in Canada. When we put out this series, the average amount of registrations, and remember comparatively, 30 classes register for a typical standard program for us, astronauts included. The average amount of registrations was 120 classes. The highest was 108. So we would have on the order of several thousand kids across the country, coast to coast to coast, keen on tuning into these amazing people to hear their stories live. This is a triumph of the notion of truth and reconciliation in Canada, of things like the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, which again was not that long ago. These are things that simply didn't exist when I was a boy. I remember I had one experience going to Crawford Lake Conservation Area as a child uh, in school, and that was the one Indigenous programming um, opportunity that I ever had, the only chance I had to learn from people firsthand. And there are so many opportunities now, and that's thrilling because as a nation, we're coming to terms with uh, a troubling history. We are coming to terms with the fact that we have, in, in many cases, erased uh, a lot of the history and modern day rich cultures of Indigenous peoples across Canada. And so I think it's really important for all of us to shift that narrative and to work towards bringing meaningful, respectful programming uh, in conjunction with Indigenous communities across Canada so that this, this excitement and enthusiasm on the part of children and the general public can be met. We want to make sure that if we're doing these programs, we're doing it in a way that again, is respectful to Indigenous communities, incorporating their insights, incorporating them personally, more importantly. And so what I wanted to do today with this first webinar is to bring in some really stalwart standout examples across the country, people who have worked in nature organizations, in science centers, in the nonprofit sector, to bring amazing programs to their communities, to build up that trust with communities across Canada, Indigenous communities across Canada, in some cases for decades, and to show you what it looks like at its best in this country with the hopes of inspiring your organizations, whether you're a nature group, whether you're a science center, whether you're joining this for the very first time, to do the same. I think that uh, as a business proposition, it behooves all of us to take this very, very seriously and to do a great deal of work to, you know, make some great stuff happen. And I think that uh, 
certainly my experience working with organizations across the country and internationally has been that there is a big desire to do this, but a lot of people don't know where to start. So I hope that this program provides the opportunity to teach you guys where to start uh, and uh, inspires you as much as it does me. To begin, uh, for those of you who had our, our agenda for today, Dolph DeYoung, CEO of the Toronto Zoo, is set to begin our broadcast. And unfortunately, uh, for reasons I can't disclose right now, he is unable to join today's meeting. So really exciting opportunity came up today. But I do want to highlight the fact that the Toronto Zoo is a truly amazing organization. We've been partnering with them for many years now. And under his leadership, they are doing incredible work to open up the zoo and wildlife and nature to more audiences than ever. With regards to their Indigenous programming in particular, I really do encourage everyone to check out torontozoo.com slash tz slash ti I see Turtle Island Conservation to see some of the work that they've done in education and conservation sectors to bridge this gap and connect Indigenous communities with their standard audience that comes to the zoo every single day. So unfortunately, Dolph can't make it. Hopefully we can have him for another broadcast in the near future because there's few people I enjoy working with more. But that leaves us with our second speaker. So I want to turn it over to Barb McKean. She is the Director of Education at the Royal Botanical Garden, and they do incredible work. I've had the chance to visit finally for the first time over the last few months, and what an amazing place, uh, which has a special, a special thing that we're going to be talking about today. This is uh, actually my experience on the... Um, with the programming or with the with the Royal Botanical Garden was the impetus that led to this program directly. So I'm really excited to have Barb in to kick off today's program. Barb, thank you so, so much for joining us today and uh, take us away. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be able to, to be here. Thanks very much for the invite, Jesse. And hi, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to my screen up here and we'll get going. What I want to do today is uh, share the story for us of a project that we uh, were able to accomplish a couple of years ago, a wonderful uh, connection that that developed oh, kind of like a just nice little bit of, uh, of luck and uh, positioning that brought things together for us to do this. And that was creating uh, Njigna Dawing Anishinaabe Wudzuin, the journey to Anishinaabe knowledge. It's a, a plant medicines trail that we were able to uh, work very closely with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation on. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the journey to the journey, because um, it was certainly not something that we set out expecting to do, but more uh, a journey that we took along with the, the group there and that. Uh, resulted in, in some, some good stuff, some uh, a, a great experience for people and something that really helps the Mississaugas uh, get the, the story of Anishinaabe plant medicines out there. Um, so uh, here at RBG, we are just at the, uh, the Western, oops, hang on for a sec. I was going to say, sorry, it's not cycling just yet. There has to be some tech difficulty, Barb, otherwise it's no fun. Yeah. Yeah, we were doing this okay. There we go. So there here we are. are. Uh, Royal Botanical Gardens uh, wrapped around the westernmost tip of Lake Ontario. So if you can see that on uh, a map, you're you're looking actually at RBG McMaster Universities. There, the the, the front foreground of the the photo in the lower left, and uh, Coots Paradise, our major piece of nature sanctuary. We have a, about 11 square kilometers of Carolinian forest, uh, wetlands, and uh, old uh, remnant prairies and uh, oak savannas in the property. So uh, quite a significant biodiversity hotspot um, located in the, the heart of the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat as well. And uh, in particular, uh, we've worked closely with and uh, enjoy um, a good relationship with the, the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation that are, are both in the area. And uh, the area has about 9,000 years of, um, of people being a part of the landscape. We have around Coots Paradise here, uh, 11 archaeological sites with artifacts that have been dated back to about 9,000 years ago. Uh, so we know throughout, um, you know, this time people have, have been in connection with this very biodiverse landscape. Uh, the, the body of water, Coots Paradise, uh, it, it is a wetland right now, a fairly open one, but 
was a, a big spot for wild rice collecting for uh, cattails, you know, harvesting f the foods from the water, from the plants, the fish there that is still the major uh, plant nurse, or pardon me, fish nursery uh, at the western end of Lake Ontario. And, uh, you know, waterfowl abounded. And in fact, the reason it's called Coots Paradise is because there was a British uh, infantry officer stationed in the Niagara Peninsula in the late 1700s who used to come hunting and this was his hunting paradise. So uh, the name Coots Paradise stuck. But um, over the years we've uh, worked, RBG has been in existence since 1941 and uh, from about oh, probably the mid 1970s um, we've been working, especially with the Haudenosaunee, um, early on, but in the world of botanical gardens, uh, ethnobotany is, is a big thing. That idea of how different cultures connect and relate with the plants that are native to their particular areas of the world. And it, it's one of the great, you know, people be, can be kind of blind to plants, really. They, you know, for a lot of people, it's just kind of green stuff in the background, but, um, but that relevance of things that you're using, you're, you're eating, you're using as medicines, you're using as fiber, um, helps make the, the connection a little bit more tangible to people. And so we've done outreach programming, working um, with a, an Indigenous plant medicine specialist from Six Nations uh, going back through the, the 70s and 80s. And uh, oh, about 15 years ago, we developed a partnership program with the Six Nations Polytechnic, the, the college um, on the Indian Reserve there. And we worked with uh, the Indigenous Studies Program at McMaster and uh, developed an ethnobotany program that was focused on two-eyed seeing. So trying to um, help the community uh, use some of the science around plant research and monitoring and documentation work, uh, along with somebody from the community who was learning that was also working very much on uh, documentation through the oral history and storytelling through the elders in the community. So uh, that was trying to help them with uh, some of the Indigenous plants that were disappearing from the area that were important medicines for them. And all of this is, has come about from really relationship building between um, Dr. David Galbraith, who's our head of science. He's been very involved. He was on the, the steering committee for the Indigenous Studies Program at McMaster. Um, but more than that, David's really, um, he's put a lot of, of personal time into the connection to the community there. So um, I guess that's the one big message are uh, the one big learning that we've had. And, you know, certainly these kind of partnerships and connections with First Nations communities happen in many different ways. But um, David's really just been there in the community. They have a lot of events, you know, whether it's a powwow or a particular festival, you know, he goes and he's there and he's gotten to know people and um, and connected with them. It's a big community. There's uh, close to 30,000 people in, uh, in Six Nations, so uh, hard to meet everybody. But he uh, he maintains close contacts with the community. So that's been an important part of the, the connections that we've had there. But what I wanted to do is talk about uh, a, a project that we did is in 2017. And uh, this actually ended up coming through another connection. And uh, again, you know, relationships that you have and connections um, with people that, that you may have crossed paths with. Um, and the name of a fellow called Doug Jakes, who was a former employee here at RBG years ago. He had worked, done quite a bit of work with First Nations in the North. He was an outdoor education teacher who tried to incorporate First Nations teaching and bringing elders in to, to work with students at the outdoor ed program that he was involved with. And uh, when Doug retired, he started working with the Mississaugas, volunteering to help them with outreach, basically connecting um, with with school boards and, and schools and other partners in the community. 
And uh, Doug called me up and in 2015, we had our first meeting with one of the elders, you know, here at the table behind me in my office. And um, we just, it was just a kind of a get to know you chat for a couple of hours, but started talking about areas of interest the community had, um, talked about ethnobotany and agreed that we'd like to get to know each other better. And in uh, early 2016, we actually took a number of our educators and science and field botany and ecology staff and spent a day at New Credit um, immersed in, in the culture, listening to the elders, learning, you know, certainly not always nice stories about what the community had been through. Their last um, native speaker passed away uh, in, I think, 1924. So the language had been lost. And um, for any culture, any group, that's, you know, a huge impediment to uh, to maintaining, you know, some of the connections with the really foundation of the their, their community and their culture. And they had been uh, working at that point with a young fellow, Joseph Pitawanaquat, who's from um, Wakwimakon First Nation on First Na and, uh, Manitoulin Island. And uh, he was a plant knowledge specialist. And he was helping to reintroduce the community to some of the medicine plants. And uh, so again, we just agreed, yep, yeah, let's, let's keep the dialogue going. So that, that connection was there when a few months later, um, uh, Ontario uh, announced the availability of some funding for sesquicentennial. And uh, this trail, we were actually at the same time looking at having to do some work on it. We had some shoreline erosion problems, massive amount of invasive species, and we wanted to do some naturalization projects. So uh, along came this opportunity for funding and uh, so we reached back to the folks at New Credit and said, hey, we, there's maybe some money here that we can uh, we can get together and work on something ethnobotanical. And uh, so we very quickly put together a plan for a plant medicines trail. And there's no small irony in the fact that what we did was take a trail that was named for a, you know, the, the symbol of British sort of dominance in the starting in the late 1700s and some government money and uh, redid the trail. But we took advantage of that. We were able to find, um, put together a proposal and, uh, and a team to do this. And uh, David Galbraith, our head of science here, Joseph Pitawanaquat, plant knowledge specialist, uh, Nancy Rowe, the, one of the elders at New Credit, uh, Doug Jakes, who I mentioned, uh, and I should say the late Doug Jakes, he, died not too soon, not too long after the, the trail was finished, but our, uh, our wayfinder, Peter Schuler, uh, elder in the community as well, myself and Tice Tysmeyer, who are, is our head of natural lands and conservation. And uh, so that was our working group. We got together, we agreed on sort of the base, um, you know, relationship and what we were trying to do. We knew we wanted to take this trail. We we're going to get rid of the invasives, replant it with medicine plants that uh, Joseph would help us with pulling the, uh, the lists together for this. And I shouldn't say help in all of these things and in Indigenous relationships, it's important to recognize that, you know, the people that you're asking to help or do things with um, may not be supported by a full-time job that actually backs them in that the way it is for us. So, so we basically contracted their help, but it was very much a labor of love for all of us. Um, but we, we came up with, you know, what, what we wanted to do in terms of, uh, of honoring their story, um, letting them tell their story um, and, you know, helping with the shaping of it and how we might, um, you know, put it in visible form for the public, but uh, but also engaging their kids um, in this. So we knew that we uh, we wanted to to make youth a part of the finding the solution, and so we moved forward on the trail work and uh, kind of overhauling the the area along the trail. 
uh, huge numbers of volunteers that participated in invasives removal. We, we removed thousands of uh, invasive shrubs and vines and uh, plants, and we replanted thousands more. And uh, some of the kids from, from Lloyd S. King, the school at uh, New Credit that were part of the, the volunteers who helped with that. And we've actually developed, we have a relationship with them now in terms of uh, supporting if, you know, anytime anybody from the school wants to bring a class out um, from there as well as at Six Nations. We cover the busing and uh, waive any fees so that they have access to the, the lands and their traditional territory. And uh, we came up with a nice experience. Um, several stations uh, along the trail, they're themed, uh, you know, women's medicine, wetland plants, that sort of thing. Uh, two little teaching areas, uh, here and at the, the far end of the trail and recognizing that the, you know, we can put things on signs and we can talk about the, the plants along the way and how they were used and what their names are and deconstruct the names and things. But, you know, much of this would normally be an oral tradition. And so in the background in the picture here, there's a little uh, solar eco box that has four teachings recorded on it. Uh, Joseph and the elders um, uh, each did uh, recordings and people can access them. There's a nice quiet place to sit. They can kind of pull up themselves up on the logs here and, uh, and listen to some two to three minute long teachings. And we um, wanted to be as inclusive as we could. It doesn't tell the Haudenosaunee story of plants. Oftentimes the same plants are used as medicines, but not always in the same way. And the names are quite different. So as a botanical garden, we create plant labels uh, and post them up. And in this case, you know, we did our usually our usual uh, scientific uh, English and French names, but we added not only the, the Anishinaabe name, but also the, the Mohawk uh, names for them as well, with all of the trees along the way. And uh, so we were able to help them share their story of their, the plant medicines. We came, the, the project went from start to finish in about 10 months. Um, we had actually two weeks to put together the funding application at the beginning, which was like a Herculean feat <laughs> to, to get that done. But uh, we had a, an opening celebration. We paid for um, buses to come up from New Credit so that the community could participate. We um, had Anishinaabe uh, food and teas and uh, offered tours of the trail. So there was a celebration and that connection with the community, again, about part of their, uh, what part of their story is and, and the part of the community or the part of the territory that the community doesn't necessarily often access. But I think one of the best parts uh, for us was hearing uh, one of the elders at the opening say, this is what reconciliation looks like. We, you know, we came together, we've walked on the same path and we've achieved something that, you know, working in collaboration and, and that's the nature of, uh, of true reconciliation. So, uh, fun project to do. And, uh, but yeah, that the, the whole thing of relationship and connection and, uh, and just being, being present and being able to find a problem to solve or a, a project to do together. So thanks very much. Chi miigwech to you, Barb. That was a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. And, and again, there are two things that really stuck out to me. One is the idea of busing people to actually come in and witness this and be a part of it in person. Uh, I've heard this increasingly from nature groups across Canada, national, provincial parks, both in Canada and worldwide. And it seems like such a small thing. For so many of us, it's very easy to get to these places and to drive or to bus ourselves. And for a lot of communities and classrooms, it's not. And I think that that's such an important thing. If you're going as an option for putting money towards something to accomplish some good, I really love that that's a, something that you incorporated into that presentation. Uh, secondly, too, you highlighted the oral history thing. I can tell you, 
I am the sort of person that when I go to a museum or a science center, I ignore those like nobody's business. I am the person who walks right by all those things. When I was on that trail, I sat and listened to the grandfather teachings when I was out looking at, at, at Coots Paradise. It was amazing. Uh, we had a, a tour group of people that came up after me and saw us doing it and did the same. And so it's such a beautiful thing on that trail. And uh, I really would hope that anyone in our audience today gets the chance to go visit in person. So thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> Thanks very much. Barb, I really appreciate kicking off our broadcast, and we are going to dive in with our second speakers now. So, again, I wanted to give as many different perspectives from a wide array of angles from the Canadian nature education landscape today. And so what I wanted to bring in next was the team from Science North. Now, I am a Toronto boy, which means that to me, Northern Ontario is like Sudbury. That is as far as you can go. It is the you know, primal wilderness. Uh, I was dissuaded of that notion finally when I had the chance to visit a couple of years back. And truly, there is no science centre more at the heart of their community than Science North. Sudbury is built around the work that they do. It is a truly incredible place. I've had the privilege of going to science centers coast to coast to coast across the country. And while I truly do love them all, including my own Toronto Ontario Science Center, I must admit Science North uh, is the, the upper, upper echelon. They do such amazing work locally and across the entirety of Northern Ontario. And that's a little bit about what we're going to speak about today. I'm going to bring in Emily Curtin and David Bates talking about the amazing work that they do both uh, on hand with their amazing exhibitions on Indigenous ingenuity happening right now and across the entirety of Northern Ontario. So Emily and Dave, I'll bring you both in to say a quick hello. And then Emily, I'll turn it over to your presentation to get us underway. Thanks for joining us, guys. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, I'm really glad that you added on the second part about uh, the work that we do across Northern Ontario, so from Sudbury and beyond. Uh, so <laughs> hello, everyone. Ani Bojo, Emily Curtin, Indigenous Cause. My name is Emily Curtin, and I'm a senior scientist with Science North, and I hold the portfolios of outreach and Indigenous initiatives. And I actually live on the traditional and ancestral lands of Fort William First Nation, on the shores of the Great Gitchigami and under the shadow of Anemki Waju. And for those of you who are not familiar with those terms, that's actually in Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is right at the northern point of Lake Superior. Uh, so Sudbury is kind of an interesting uh, place, but so is Thunder Bay. And Science North actually has locations in both cities. So um, we can go to the next slide here. Um, so I always like to put up this slide because I know there's people who might be listening in who are not so familiar with Ontario. Ontario is a very huge place. And so it's nice to show this map with Texas overlaid because people might be more familiar with the shape and size of Texas. And you can really see how huge our province is. So in, um, in Sudbury, we have two physical science science centers. And our Thunder Bay location is really just a satellite operation. So we really do just outreach from here. We have an office, we have about eight staff that work out of here. And we travel to all of Northern Ontario from this location, the Northwest mainly. Um, so the other thing that's kind of interesting for Northern Ontario is that there's over 110 First Nations communities within this part of the province. So geographically, the communities are very, very spread out. And and we reach about 65 of those communities with our outreach program. And many of those are not accessible by conventional road. They're fly-in or ice road-in only. We've been doing this outreach for over 30 years, but have really put focus into it in the last 10 years. And we've done this by making it a part of our strategic plan and highlighting the need to more deeply engage with Indigenous audiences. So for my presentation today, I thought that, you know, not only do I have the pleasure of talking to you about connecting Indigenous ways of knowing and contemporary science, but I also get to talk to you about one of my passions, which is ensuring equitable access to science learning. And I really loved what Barb said about making sure that there was access to the Royal Botanical Gardens for the First Nations members uh, in that area, and I think that that's beautiful. So one of the most important ways to ensure equitable access is to plan it that way from the start. And at Science North, we've made it a part of our mission statement to ensure that all people can engage with the science in their everyday lives. And in our Indigenous Initiatives Department, we've taken it a step further to ensure that the science we're teaching is relevant to an Indigenous audience. And we've also really worked hard to ensure that we have the funding to reach the farthest and most remote areas in Northern Ontario. Um, this is just a few pictures of us doing our thing across the north. 
so I often get asked, you know, how do we do this? How do we go about providing science programming to Indigenous audiences? And there's a lot to that question. And there are entire conferences that cover that topic. So I'm just going to go over the highlights of how Science North has done it and what has worked for us. And I'm interested, you know, in making sure that we're we're having culturally appropriate programming. But really, when you look at this list on this slide, I really think that it's not in order of priority or what's important, because honestly, Indigenous voices is probably the thing that should be brought to the top and be one of the most important things when we're talking about keeping programming relevant. So we need to include Indigenous voices when designing the programming from the start. And the best way to do that is to hire Indigenous staff. You know, building relationships with the community whose traditional territory you live and work on is another way. And start a relationship with the Indigenous Friendship Center in the city or town that you work in. Um, you could offer free programming to the youth center at the local First Nations community. You could start building trust and friendship in that way. And um, if you have an Indigenous advisory committee, or if you've ever thought about forming an Indigenous advisory committee, this is also a really important way to bring in those Indigenous voices into your programming. And then that brings in the cultural appropriateness because those two things go hand in hand. The other thing is that we want to make sure that our programs are fun and engaging and the topics are things that you know teachers in schools or community members they actually want they want these these topics they want the kids to learn about this stuff. And then the other thing that we always say is make space for learning. And this doesn't mean learning for the students. This actually means learning for your own staff. When you go into a First Nations community, you often are invited to do more than just be there to present. Uh, and so we always like to make sure that we do that. So if you are in a community and there's a community feast that night, you go to it and you spend time with them and you talk to them. And that gives you the chance to learn about that community and, and make friends within that community and start to build relationships that way. Uh, the other thing, um, that I thought I would just point out are some quick examples of types of things that we have done in the last little while that have really put focus into the idea of bringing more Indigenous science knowledge into the realm of contemporary science and kind of marrying those two things together. So some quick examples are that uh, this past summer, we were honored to be content deliverers for the National Science Camp, which allowed us to connect with youth, youth across Canada. So the National Science Camp is run by Indigenous Services Canada, and it brings youth from communities all across the country and it brings them together this this summer was virtual to learn about really cool stuff that's happening in the world of stem so science technology engineering and mathematics so we put together indigenous ingenuity themed stem kits uh, they were related to indigenous innovations and in the picture you can see a youth building a macaque which is a birch bark basket and using the basket, we talked to the students about buoyancy and the biochemical composition of birch bark that makes it waterproof and rot resistant. So a really amazing way to tie in that science with the indigenous piece. The other thing uh, that uh, Jesse mentioned is that we uh, right now are extremely grateful to be hosting the Montreal Science Center's traveling exhibit, which is called Indigenous Ingenuity, Timeless Inventions. And we're actually bringing it to a local art gallery in Thunder Bay at the beginning of December. This exhibit really looks at the intersectionality of indigenous ways of knowing and contemporary science and has traditional knowledge and techniques presented alongside modern, modern science as really being mutually uh, complementary. Um, so it's very hands-on. There's lots of amazing stuff in it. Kids get to learn how to build an igloo. They get to see what a teepee looks like and the science of the smoke moving through the teepee and airflow. Um, it's a really beautiful exhibit. So we're excited to have it in Thunder Bay. It's in Sudbury currently. It's just about to close there. And then we're creating a smaller version of that exhibit and we're gonna travel that across Northern Ontario for the next two years. And again, that's that equity access piece. We want to make sure that small venues can also have a chance to have this exhibit there. And then we developed a planetarium show. Uh, we also received Ontario 150 funding back in 2017. And we developed a show called Under the Same Stars Nin Wadizuin. And uh, it looks at the Anishinaabe constellations, which, you know, 
frankly, make a lot more sense to me when I look at a set of stars and I learn about why they're there based on the natural seasonal cycles. That makes it easier for me to remember them and the stories that go along with them. Um, and so that was, a, that was a really beautiful show that we created in partnership and collaboration with many Indigenous consultants and scientists and storytellers and musicians. Um, and We've developed an incredible number of partnerships through all of this. Um, we're currently in a partnership with the Northern Ontario School of Medicine and their Indigenous Affairs Unit to create programming that helps youth to see the educational pathway to health sciences that's open to them. So we're really excited to get going on that. And um, a lot of that is going virtual and has been virtual over this past year. So. Just if you're someone who's sitting listening to this right now, just a couple quick little tips about doing things virtually with Indigenous audiences. Um, again, making sure that your programming is engaging, making sure that the topics are things that schools and communities really want and are interested in. And then something that um, is really important to think about is sending home kits of materials for kids. And again, that's about access. So, you know, youth that are in a really northern community might not have access to the simple tools that you think of as being simple. So it's really important to be able to send them that kit so that they have the things they need in order to engage with the science that you're hoping to teach them. And then the other thing that we have done recently is we've done cultural competency training with the entirety of our organization. And uh, we did this over an eight week period through January through until March of this year. And, you know, everyone was online. So it was the perfect time to do it. We did uh, every Friday, we would sit down with this group called the Blue Sky Healing Lodge, and they would teach us about uh, an aspect of Indigenous culture, spirituality, um, historical things that, you know, are really important for everybody to know. And it was an awesome opportunity and a really great way for people to, to connect and to learn about um, Indigenous culture. And then the last thing before I hand it over to Dave is just a couple other quick things to consider. So if you are interested in doing virtual programming with, with Indigenous audiences, think about the internet connectivity because some communities might not have the best internet in the North or there's certain times in the day that are best. The time zone difference, as you know, Jesse knows this very well, is across Canada, you're dealing with lots of different time zones. And so make sure you pick a time that works for the West and the East and the North. Um, and then I cannot recommend enough how important it is to have an Indigenous advisory committee. Science North has two committees because we have such a huge area that we cover. So we have a Northwest and a Northeast Indigenous Advisory Committee. Um, and we've had those formed for about four years now and their voices are just so, so important. And hiring Indigenous staff is just probably the number one thing that every organization can do that wants to engage with Indigenous audiences because your their voice is at the table and especially with kids they see themselves reflected back when the person who's speaking to them is an Indigenous person. I'm going to pass it over to Dave now and so what that means is that I have to mute myself so thank you very much. Thank you Emily that was spectacular. I'm going to bring up Dave and take us away. I'm so excited to see what you have to share with us today. Oh, uh, thanks so much. Hi, I'm Dave, and oh, uh, I'm Dave. And I'm, uh, I'm a staff scientist for these initiatives. I'm a Métis molecular biologist, and I'm here to give you a quick five-minute rundown of basically some best tips and tricks and things that I found. Because assuming you've done all the things that we've talked about, and all the other people have talked about as well, and you've got an invitation to go and present a whole lot of things inside a, a First Nations community, uh, well, what, what, what's What's some things you should know? Well, and the answer is everything, because every single First Nations community is different. Um, the, the entire the, the entire continent of, of Turtle Island is phenomenally different from north to south, east to west, from populated places to very very far flung remote uh, First Nations communities. And so there's no there's no real easy cut and dry way to just say, yeah, you do this and you'll be good. You got to know people. You have to know, have the people in the community that have invited you in, the people that you're talking with. Ask them what is good to bring, what you should do. And it's important to bring things. And if you can bring up the, our my one slide, I only have one. So the, a few of the best tips and tricks are on the slide, which are, well, I'll tell you about them. So <laughs> there we go. And I'm, as you can tell, I'm obviously a very serious person, but I'm not really. So snacks are key. 
uh, in every possible way. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it goes deeper than that. Yes, you should bring them when you go and visit because the communities that I'm going to visit and that, that I'm talking about, because that's, that's my area of expertise and the areas that I've been to are very remote First Nations. And sometimes you know, there are snacks not available for either for you or for the people you're working with. And so you, if you can provide them, you'll make a whole lot of friends with it quickly. And that's true and pretty much anywhere around the, around the globe. But also the type of snacks and they can, snacks can sometimes provide a gateway to talking about all kinds of cool stuff when it comes, it comes to science. Like, for example, talking about different uh, foods that are in the region, foods that you brought up, and cool things that can, that can be done with food. Like, for example, a lot of, in a lot of remote First Nation communities, a lot of kids have been part of a hunt. You can talk about how after an animal freshly killed, you went into the salt and the muscle began to spasm and that's super, super cool. Or talk about the talk about the way the orange juice can be uh, is acidic and can change things. There's, there are a whole lot of different part of things to talk about based upon snacks, but I'm, I'm going too long. Sorry. So, Second part, stay out, uh, help out and stay late and clean up. And that's really, really important because you should probably be humble when you go into a community. Um, <laughs> after all, uh, you're there as a guest. You're there to help out. And your job is not just to present your program or to bring what you brought to go and share with everyone because what you have is so important. That's not the point. You're there to meet with people, to meet with people in the community. And you can tell your, your cool science stuff and that's really important and awesome, but you're there to help. So pick up some garbage afterwards and don't just leave when your program is finished. You just hang around. If you're doing things with, with youth, which is what I, of course, tend to do, you're going to have a lot of people hanging around because what you've done is really, really cool. And so you can explain more things. And that's how you get involved in the community and get invited to go and do really neat things and make the most important connections. It's not what you do yeah, as part of your job, it's what you do afterward that's the most important thing. And that's, I mean, that's true anywhere, but doubly true, and particularly in remote First Nations. Uh, make sure you bring what you needed and you buy what you don't. And what I mean by that is remember that a lot of these places, if you're going to a remote First Nation community, again, I got I to gotta stress that remote First Nations can be very, very different from places that are close by larger population centers. But remember that often you don't have access to things like, say, frozen strawberries or or, or, or um, an easy source to get a whole lot of water at a moment's notice. A lot of the places you'll, you'll be present, presenting might be, say, in open fields or in, um, in, uh, in Powell Arbors, which are not really set up for um amenities and that kind of stuff so bring what you need for, the, for your location and bring it all and then when you're there support the, lo the, the local economy don't just bring a subway sandwich from that you've driven four hours along bumpy dirt roads um find out if there's a place in the community to get some cool bannock burgers or because there's often places that locals will know about and that's cool to support also it's just fun also, make sure you bring a proper way in and a proper way out. You don't, <laughs> remote, remote communities are remote for a reason. And sometimes the type of vehicle you're traveling in literally won't be able to make it through. But that's true pretty much anywhere. Okay, um, bias, and it's not always what you'd think. When you're presenting to different groups, obviously people have different reactions. And again, biggest thing is talking, if you're presenting to First Nations, um, say, kids in a classroom and you're in a places, in the far north or in far or remote areas in northern Ontario, I mean, kids are different depending upon where they are. And it's often the case, not always the case. And important to remember that places are, places and people are different, but um, often you don't get a strong reaction to what you would see, say, in a more populated center. You're not, it's, it's, you'll often have to really, really amp up your energy and then when that responds at all, and that is absolutely fine. Because that's just not how it's done. You don't react massively. You're still having a great time, but maybe the, the everyone is just sitting back and they're really enjoying it, but they're not going to participate or jump up or do things that you might have expected. And if you're not expecting that, as you as a presenter, that can be really, really draining. So just be, be, be cool with it. You're, you're doing a, a great job. They're enjoying it. Just remember, you might not pick up on the cultural clues of that particular community, and that's, that, that's great. Also, uh, different communities are, have different sort of exposure levels to pop culture. Uh, a lot of far north, I've, back to, over the years that I do it, you've been able to see um, different school groups slowly get access to internet, and suddenly the mean jokes I'm making finally start landing, uh, which is kind of cool, but also kind of not. Um, be kind, always important. Be there and be funny. Really important to be kind because you know you're in uh, you're in a place with people that you don't know very well, and 
be funny because not everything has to be serious. And that's a big part of pretty much all, uh, you know, uh, uh, all Ojibwe communities is that laughter is a huge part of things and you, you can be there. You can be goofy, be yourself and be the servant and not the savior. And this is a really, really big one because when, when we, well, uh, everyone really um, goes in to do outreach about a topic we're passionate about, we're super, super excited. We have this thing we want to show and um, well, we believe that this particular thing we're showing is going to change the world if only you would just have a look at it and it's going to be so awesome. But uh, that happens all the time to a lot of communities. You don't want to go and be like, you should just learn this because that's not going to work. You're there to show them that science is cool independently. It's neat. Just look at this. It's really cool. And kindle uh, a, a kind of a interest in science, not just not uh, a blowtorch. And so you're there to help. You're there to sort of inspire, but you're not there to show and, and necessarily educate. Okay. So, uh, and that's quick. Simple, uh, simple, uh, simple. Maybe valuable, maybe not. Bullet points and ways to uh, engage different audiences. David, thank you so much for that. I, I know it's rapid fire, and there's there's more that you could pack into a, a slide, or more that you could ever pack into one single slide. But I really appreciate that for a lot of our groups today that are joining again, nature organization, science centers that might be thinking about diving in with this work. I think that's a really important message to get across. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And uh, Emily, too, if you want to turn your camera back on, I'll, I'll say a quick uh, thank you and farewell to you guys both. Uh, but you highlighted the importance of, of fostering cultural competency. And I, I wanted to bring this up. I confirmed with Emily before I got this, but Blue Sky Community Healing Center is the organization that they partnered with. And try and find groups near you. If you want to find out uh, how to do this well and, and make sure that your staff are as, as equipped culturally and able to have these conversations as, as best possible, uh, I really encourage you to seek out that training. And of course, Emily's message of higher Indigenous staff is something that's very central to everything that we ought to be doing as organizations across Canada. So thank you both so much for joining us today and really appreciate the, the time to, to share with you both. So David, Emily, thanks guys. And uh, Farewell for now. Uh, we are nearing the end of our broadcast. Well, what I want to do is bring in our last speaker in just a minute. And I must say, I am very, very lucky to be in the position where I get to work with some of the most amazing people around the globe, whether they're conservationists, educators, explorers, and, and more. And I don't know if there's anyone in Canada that has quite the level of uh, respect from such a wide array of audiences, governments, nonprofits, people that I've worked with uh, than Jeff Green. Jeff Green is the founder uh, of Students on Ice, the Students on Ice Foundation, was the spearheader for the amazing Canada C3 uh, tour across, or, or journey across Canada on their incredible voyage back to the sesquicentennial, which we've, we've talked a lot about today. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Jeff in just a second to talk to us a little bit about his story, uh, the work that he's done over several decades to build up relationships with Indigenous communities, and so, so much more. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, yeah, welcome in. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jesse. Uh, very kind intro. Um, and uh, great to be with all of you. I, I first just want to uh, acknowledge that I'm coming to you today from the traditional lands and territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe here in Gatineau, Quebec, along the shores of the Gatineau River, uh, which we are fortunate to to call home and where we work, play, and, and are raising our family. Um, great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Barb and Emily and Dave. Uh, really enjoyed your presentations. Um, Barb, you made me think of the National Healing Forest Initiative, which might be something you could collaborate with, and I could I can get you in touch with the, the team that's behind that. Um, but we're we're we've been part of the Nature for All journey uh, right from the beginning, uh, back in Hawaii. And we're proud to be part of the uh, the Canadian uh, uh, Commission for for um, the ICN. So yeah, um, I just want to take you guys first on a little bit of a journey, and then I'll, I'll I'll leave the slides and just point out a few key lessons, I suppose, that we've learned over over the years um, at the Students on Ice Foundation. So I hope this will work. <laughs> Jesse and I tried it out a couple of times. <laughs> While you're pulling it up, I'll just note, because I know it was a little tricky with the computer earlier, uh, National Healing Forest is an organization that we're actually sending out information up to our entire network of students that joined us for Secret Path Week. They do amazing work. I did bring it up on the banner already, but uh, National Healing Forest dot com some really really great stuff there so whether it's barb or any of our partners uh they do really fantastic stuff peter and patricia uh have made that all possible jeff you're screen sharing it's working 
we'll just put those pictures now when you got them up, I'll make them full screen and uh, we should be good to it's go. It's a miracle. Okay, great. Let's do it. There has to be some. Whoa. Where'd you go? I, I'm gone, but you're still here. Oh, oh good. Okay. I got full screen. It was working. It was working good. So just a little bit about Students on Ice. Um, we're a charitable foundation in Canada and in the U.S. And our logo is conveniently the planet uh, with the polar regions. And then in the middle of it is a youth. Um, and that is a compass that represents the, the journey our youth are navigating, uh, certainly at the beginning of their, their lives. And what we've been doing for the last 22 years is using the polar regions as classrooms. Uh, we use ships as the floating classroom. And what really initially started as, as connecting to nature has become so much more. It's connecting to each other, it's connecting to ourselves and connecting to so many of the, the issues, challenges, opportunities that we face these days. And um, it's really about inspiring connection and empowering that leadership, those future leaders that we all need for a sustainable future. Um, Mother Nature's the greatest teacher of them all. So we're just facilitating uh, that type of learning um, during these formative years to lead, to act, and to change. Not just for our youth, but these are formative years for our planet. This next decade is absolutely critical uh, to get on a pathway uh, that we need to be in, in so many ways with reconciliation, with uh, with the environment, with net zero, and, and so much more. So it's a critical time for the work we're all doing. Um, what started 20 years ago with one Indigenous student uh, on our program, now over 50% of the participants are, are Indigenous. And th that's Inuit, First Nation, Métis, as well as uh, Indigenous youth from all over the world. Um, and that's quite intentional. Um, because for so many reasons and it's just enriched our program so greatly our staff are also uh, a real mix of society um, and and professions and backgrounds but about 30 percent of our staff are indigenous and that representation is so critical because people need to see themselves in in their mentors and and the, the, what they're striving for and and to feel safe and comfortable so so we've really uh, worked hard to make this accessible to all all demographics, regardless of of uh, socioeconomic status. And 80% of the youth are fully funded by scholarships to participate. So it's free of charge. I'd say if I had to sum it up, it's about touching hearts. Uh, we can fill heads with all kinds of information, as we know, especially these days. But it's touching the heart when change happens and a commitment happens. And 90% and of our alumni say that their experiences have, have changed them in so many ways, including what they're, the causes they're passionate about. And on our 20 year journey, um, yeah, this is, these are just some statistics from our 20 year impact report that we're super proud of. Um, and we've worked to have youth from 434 communities across the, the country and hopefully all the communities where you're from today. It's very hands-on, it's very holistic, um, and it's a mix of every, everything imaginable, and we're always growing and changing. It's intergenerational, which is critical, and here are some, um, uh, some elders from Pond Inlet speaking to our youth at a, an old sod house site um, where their ancestors used to live. And like these are the moments where Things like just uh, it, stuff happens that you can't you can't really you tend to describe. Obviously, I'm having trouble, but uh, it's very emotional, very powerful, and life changing. And there's moments where, you, with because of that mix, and and you, you, here's Minister McKenna kayaking with Musa, an Inuit elder. Her perspective of the Arctic changed completely that day. Um, she'd never been to the Arctic. She'd never paddled with uh, an Inuk elder. And she then saw the Arctic through a human perspective, uh, which she hadn't really seen before. Um, there's just all these moments. It's about trust. It's about relationships. It's about people, place, experience. And then, of course, what you do afterwards to, to make an impact. And this is just one of many types of quotes we have from our thousands of alumni, um, 3,500 alumni and 50. 
five countries around the world. A glimpse of our future plan. This is a bit um, ambitious, but uh, what the heck, eh? Um, you gotta, you gotta go big, I think. And we have a lot of other things going on at our foundation. One is called Expedition to Community, and it's been an effort to support um, youth-led, community-supported uh, projects in five, soon to be seven, uh, communities across Inuit Nunungat, um, and it's it's been remarkable it's been a remarkable journey so far and we're really proud of that another new program we have is called blue futures pathways and it's all about connecting youth to the um, opportunities of the sustainable blue economy but it also has a, a special emphasis on indigenous youth and i'll explain why um, and as jesse mentioned in 2017 we did this uh a journey called canada c3 coast to coast to coast it also stood for crazy, 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 <laughs> but um, it was an extraordinary, emotional, powerful journey that looked at Canada's past, present, and potential future. Um, Murray Sinclair uh, coined it a journey of reconciliation, and it didn't start out that way. It started out as this celebration of Canada, 150 years. But soon uh, we realized uh, quite early on that it, it was much more than that. And and the participants were a cross-section of Canadian society. This was the ship we used, a former Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker uh, called the Polar Prince. And every 10 days, we brought a different cross-section of Canadian society on board. And it was that which made it such a powerful thing. Um, we designed the journey in so many um, extraordinary ways. This was the legacy room. And, Jesse, you mentioned uh, Gord Downey and the Downey Foundation. Uh, this was the, uh, you can see the pictures on the wall there, the Gord Downey Chani Wenjack Legacy Room. It was a sacred space that we created on the ship where smudging could take place, where very, very emotional, powerful conversations and sharing took place. Uh, there were a lot of tears shed in that room, but also, um, incredible moments of of learning and, and connection and relationships and friendships um but we heard about uh, so much about the truth of canada that had not been known to so many canadians including many in our group we had all kinds of incredible indigenous youth elders leaders on board um i could talk to you for an hour about the legacy room and everything it represented and and all the the i the the items that were gifted to us as we made our journey coast to coast to coast that represented all. And I have to say one thing that was extraordinarily uh, uh, an epiphany in a way was from the moment we left the, the tip of Newfoundland, let's go back to that map until we got all the way over to the tip of Vancouver Island, we were exclusively in indigenous community. That's 70% of Canada's coastline. And that's a narrative that is not really told or known in our country, but um, the indigenous peoples of, across the country have been the gatekeepers, the guardians, the stewards of our coastlines and much more for millennia. Um, this is a, just a quick story about one of the elders on our journey, Roger Hitkalik from uh, Kagluktuk Nunavut. He came on board for one of the legs and Roger told me a story about being shipwrecked when he was six years old with his family on an island and they had to stay there for three months until the freeze up and then they could walk across the ice back to their community this is one of the most remote islands in in the whole country in the middle of the northwest passage so we immediately you know again taking leadership and direction from our indigenous um participants and friends we we changed course and we went to that island and this is what we found we parked the ship right on the beach. Within five minutes, Roger found a piece of his dad's boat that had, when they shipwrecked there 60 years earlier, he's now 75. Um, it was an extraordinary night, but then we also found up on the top of the island, ruins of Middle Dorset people who had lived there over three to 4,000 years ago. We were walking in the footsteps of people thousands of years ago and it really put into context the idea of celebrating Canada 150 to say the least 
every morning started with a sharing circle and every day finished with a sharing circle. And it was an incredible way of, of just connecting, getting to know each other uh, and so much more. Um, and we, we were so fortunate to have indigenous leaders like Gujao from Guayhanas, Haida Gwai, uh, join us. Quite often, the day would start like this. Here I am with Chief Ted of the Awikino and Rivers Inlet, basically telling me that they're not celebrating Canada 150, but welcome. <laughs> and then the day would unfold, and and then we'd wind up in in the big house, and we would we would have hours and hours of connection and sharing, and that's what it was all about. It was it was that trust and relationship and human to human, face to face that made it so powerful. Um, this was uh, on in Newfoundland where um, uh, uh, Chief Meisel Joe gifted us a canoe as a symbol of, of reconciliation to take with us across the country, which we did. Um, so that's just a little bit of, uh, of, of background, and I'll, I'll stop sharing if I can here. Um, where do I go? Oh, there we go. Stop sharing. Am I back? You're back, Jeff. <laughs> so a couple of quick, I'd say, takeaways. Um, recognizing the barriers. Uh, we, we learned in many cases the hard way over the last 22 years. Um, with our youth, we've had to streamline or adapt everything from the application process to the communication process. In some communities where internet is not great you know you gotta you gotta make it accessible so you lo use local radio stations to get the message out uh, but again it, it comes back to that trust factor and and so we've done a lot of networking and partnership building over years and years and and and, and that really helps in every possible way um having that trust uh our our office team here at our office um, we're always striving to have as many indigenous staff members as we can we have training for our other staff and then on the expeditions uh, as i mentioned we have about 30 percent of our staff right now that are indigenous i love the point about the advisory committee and so on for c3 we actually hired an indigenous consultant and and she worked with us on all kinds of things from protocols um, to just how to how to address situations um, when I presented to the national executive of the, uh, of the AFN, um, I took tobacco to, for each member of, of the committee before I started my presentation. And it was these meaningful things, um, that, yeah, just made, it, it, it was a learn part of our learning journey, but it was so helpful, um, in so many ways. We found a lot of our indigenous youth at the beginning of our programs were quite, um, overwhelmed. In some cases, they'd never been out of their community, and here they were in a big city to go on an expedition to the bottom of the world in Antarctica um, or the Arctic. So, so we we started a program called Savitute, which is a three day program just for our Indigenous youth, and it 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 be, it's more than just acclimatizing them. It it we brought in leaders and educators, and and it just built really help to build them up and prepare them for the journey um, ahead. And, and we're going to continue to do that for as long as our program exists. On all of our expeditions now, we have a health and wellness team, uh, usually eight people, counselors, elders, uh, doctor, and that's to make mental health the, uh, as, as important as climate change or polar bears and penguins. Um, it's to create that safe space, provide the tools, and be ready because because when you put youth in a, a healthy, nurturing, positive environment, no matter who they are, a lot of stuff comes out, and you've got to be ready to 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 take that on and uh, turn it into a positive. So, uh, health and wellness team's been get uh, critical. Translation: uh, We are now almost everything we do is in at least three languages, uh, and Nictitut being the main third language. Um, so, we everything's done through that indigenous centric lens um not we don't do anything unless it has that kind of blessing um support and and yeah reflective of all these types of things i've mentioned and sometimes you can't 
you, you can't predict things. And I'll share one very powerful story. Um, one of our participants on C3 came on board um, and her cabin was number 47. And, and she couldn't go into that cabin because that was the number her mother was given at residential school. And she, it makes me emotional just telling that story, but eventually she did use that cabin and she, she moved in because it was a way of honoring her mom and what her mom had gone through. And, but we could not have anticipated that at all. Um, but then it became part of our learning journey together. Um, we're blessed to have so many incredible partners and, and, um, and we're, yeah, uh, indigenous partners, I, I should say beyond all kinds of other partners. And so it's, it's, it's a, it's core part of what we do. We're always learning. Um, and, and uh, thanks so much, Jesse, for the opportunity to, to share. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, I, of course, would love to, to answer them. Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, what a, a beautiful story and journey. And uh, I had the first opportunity to hear you speak in one of the pictures you shared in one of those programs, I guess, of the Walrus Talks uh, back in, in 2017, the amazing uh, journey across Canada with all sorts of uh, programs being done coast to coast to coast. And uh, uh, it's it was heartening getting the chance to partner with Canada at Exploring by the City of your Pants to help share these stories virtually. So all those programs are still on our YouTube channel. If you want to hear directly live from the ship, there's a lot of great stuff there. Um, you brought up, the again, the website, soifoundation.org, and I really encourage people to check that out uh, to find out more about the work you're doing. But uh, no, I just really appreciate you joining today, Jeff. This has been really special. So thank you so much. Hey, thanks, everybody. And and yeah, there's also a great documentary on our, on our homepage, the C3 sure. doc. And I didn't mention the alumni program, but if any of you out there are interested in we have a, a very robust alumni program and mentorships and and financial grants and opportunities it's so critical to to provide those to uh members of your community and, and that's become a program within the program for us <laughs> you you're a busy man i can't believe you carved out an hour to join us today and i appreciate that so so much uh canada c3 site the documentary is beautiful and as is the companion book uh certainly my my oma absolutely loved it i got the chance to pass it around to friends and family after i got you guys so thank you very much for, for providing that and uh Again, thanks for joining us today, Jeff. This has been very special. <laughs> all right, guys, we could talk all day about this topic, This, uh, the importance of Indigenous programming and opportunities to develop that trust, build those relationships, and really reach your communities uh, with the importance of this, this living history and, and living culture uh, is you know, integral to all that we should be doing uh, as organizations in the years to come. This could fill an entire conference, and I appreciate you all sticking around with me for the hour today as we heard some great stories on tangible solutions and how groups have brought those great programs to their communities on uh, ways of making sure that you're doing it in a culturally appropriate way and seeing uh, with Jeff's program some really, really inspiring examples of what this looks like in action on the ground coast to coast to coast across our wonderful country. I wanted to leave off with just a few quick messages to wrap up. First and foremost, as part of the Nature for All community, I really do encourage you guys to check out their site, see the campaigns they're doing. Uh, with the spirit of Nature for All being networking, if you want to reach out and connect with me to connect with our organizations that presented today, other things that have been mentioned throughout the broadcast, like the National Healing Forest Project or more, please do reach out. My email is jessehildebrand at gmail.com. If you don't include that second H, it goes to a very nice man in West Virginia who is not me. So please feel free to get in touch. I'm open to you know chatting with anyone anytime about this. I, you know This is a topic that really uh, speaks to me personally, and I hope you as well, live or after the fact in the broadcast. So please do feel free to get in touch. And finally, one of the resources that we've heard from so many of our partners over the years is really a, a top-notch, exhaustive look at uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada is the Indigenous Peoples Atlas of Canada from the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. So this is another sesquicentennial 2017 amazing initiative. I really encourage you to check this out. Charlene Bearhead is the amazing person behind a lot of the work they've done at the RCGS over the years, and this is a really top-notch resource. So with that, I'll end off our broadcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you're as inspired as I am, and I wish you a wonderful rest of your day, and that you'll join in with these amazing groups today in, in working to, you know, work towards meaningful reconciliation and bring these stories to your communities.